I'm delighted to welcome you. And I want to thank you for spending this part of your day with Stony Brook. We're so pleased to debut a short video developed in celebration of this year's 50th anniversary of Stony Brook Chemistry Nobel Laureate Paul C. Lauderbur's discoveries that led to the invention of magnetic resonance imaging, MRI. This video features faculty from the Department of Chemistry who share more about Professor Lauderbur, as well as research in the department and the fundraising campaign founded on Professor Lauderbur's legacy. I'd like to take this time to welcome Nicole Sampson, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences and SUNY Distinguished Professor of Chemistry, who will join us at the conclusion of the video and introduce today's speakers. Through her 28 years as a researcher and educator, Dr. Sampson has mentored numerous students and has championed expanding opportunities for all students through their coursework and research. She is a strong example of Stony Brook's excellence in providing inspiration for our next generation of leaders. Enjoy the video and our forthcoming presentation. is called the central science and the reason it's the central science is because if you think of a graph with a node in the middle it's related to biology it's related to physics it's related to mathematics and so um, and it's also a practical business not only is it intellectually interesting but it is a practical business of making materials and understanding how biological molecules work making drugs for example so it's kind of central to everything the Part of chemistry that excites me the most is that it has no boundary. You could do whatever you want with it, like starting from a living cell to the vast universe. Innovation and excitement about the discoveries that we can make to solve the world's problems like tuberculosis or new materials to build chairs that are not going to pollute the environment, so recyclable, sustainable plastics. Uh, being able to solve those big problems, I would hope is interesting for investment from the federal government or from individuals and from foundations. Those are important problems for society. They're not just important problems for chemists. I think some people forget why you become a scientist. You become a scientist because you're curious about how things work. And it's that curiosity that drives scientific discovery. And when, when you talk to you know, the federal government and funding agencies about how to support science, of course they want applications. We want a new drug tomorrow. We want a new drug for COVID tomorrow. But this, this is applications of basic science, that, uh, of science that was discovered many years ago and started because somebody was interested in how something worked. So this interdisciplinary research builds on the legacy of Paul Outerber, who was our Nobel Prize winner in physiology or medicine in 2003 for discoveries that led to the invention of magnetic resonance imaging. And so think about, you know, the discovery of the structure of DNA. And now today we're doing gene editing to try and treat disease. Always you wake up in the morning and you want to know more, right? And knowledge is power. Uh, but always you have the question that you have to challenge it, you know? Um, So welcome everyone to today's presentation of interdisciplinary research in chemistry, building on the legacy of Nobel laureate Paul C. Lauderbur. It is so wonderful to see all of you virtually today. And I'm particularly pleased to introduce this presentation from the Department of Chemistry, because as a longtime faculty member, I've personally witnessed much of the innovative research and achievements that will be discussed today. I have heard so many stories about Paul Lauderbur's work over the years, his work in the department that has been shared with me. And I'm very pleased that our two co-presenters are here today to share with you. So let me introduce our distinguished co-presenters. Dr. Peter Tong, distinguished professor and chair of the Department of Chemistry, and by courtesy, uh, professor of the Department of Radiology. 
and Dr. Charles Prunner, Professor and Founding Director of the Advanced Imaging Research Center at Oregon Health and Science University, and a former professor here at Stony Brook. Dr. Springer received his bachelor's in chemistry from St. Louis University and his PhD in chemistry from Ohio State University. He was a postdoctoral associate in the Aerospace Research Laboratory at the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. He was a member of the Stony Brook Chemistry faculty for 35 years and also at the, a scientist at the Brookhaven National Laboratory for the last 10 of those 35 years. Dr. Springer served as director of the Advanced Imaging Research Center for six years and is a member of the OHSU, Oregon Health Sciences University, Physiology and Pharmacology and Biomedical Engineering faculty. He's received the U.S. Air Force Research and Development Award, the Brookhaven National Laboratory Science and Technology Award, and is a fellow of the International Society for Magnetic Resonance in Medicine, where he served on the Board of Trustees and also serves on the editorial boards of NMR Biomedicine and Contrast Media and Molecular Image. Dr. Peter Tong, here with us today, is the current department chair and who obtained his BSc and PhD degrees in biochemistry from the University of Birmingham and joined the Department of Chemistry at Stony Brook in 1996. He serves as associate editor for the American Chemical Society Journal ACS Infectious Diseases and co-directs the NIH-funded chemical biology training program. Professor Tong has strongly supported initiatives to build non-invasive positrons for transmission tomography, better known as PET, human imaging infrastructure that links chemistry with life science departments and the School of Medicine. He is also the director of the Center for Advanced Study of Drug Action, whose mission is to improve drug activity prediction in humans, thereby increasing the success rate of new drug so without further ado, I present you Professor Peter Tong, and thank you again to everyone for joining us today. Thank you so much, Nicole, for that very kind introduction. Uh, I, I would like to welcome you all to our presentation today. It's wonderful to have you with us. I'm going to share a bit of background about the department first, and then I'm going to let um, Dr. Springer talk about Professor Lauterber, because um, Dr. Springer overlapped with um, Dr. Lauterbrook at Stony Brook. So he knows, has some personal anecdotes to tell us. I am the 14th chair in department history um, and um, cunningly chose a picture of myself from way before I actually became chair. Um, just as historical note, chemistry started at the Oyster Bay campus. Some of you may remember that. Uh, down on uh, Oyster, um, Long Island Oyster Bay. And chemistry started at Oyster Bay uh, with the founding chair, Professor Bonner. Chemistry then, um, the university then moved to Stony Brook in 1962. And that's when we, they built old chemistry, which is circled in the middle of this picture with a view looking out over the campus towards Long Island Sound. In 1971, the university built new chemistry, um, which is now 50 years old, new chemistry with 300,000 square feet with 400 fume hoods. That's where we do all our research and teaching nowadays. Since then, old chemistry has been converted into teaching space and has been, there's been an addition built called Fry Hall, which is beautiful uh, space for lecturing and, and for small classrooms and for teaching students. This is a picture of the newer chemistry building um, in all its glory. And you can see here's new chemistry uh, um, added onto old chemistry. And here's one more shot of the campus looking out over, over the Long Island Sound. In the foreground is the School of Medicine. And in the circle is um, chemistry buildings. And here's old chemistry and here's new chemistry. And of course, one of the strengths of Stony Brook is that we have a medical school and hospital on the same campus as the research university. A few statistics about the department. We have 40 faculty, um, 18 affiliated faculty, eight lecturers, and 35 postdocs and senior scientists and about 200 graduate students. And since 1963, 
the plant has awarded nearly 3,500 degrees, um, over 2,000 of which have been bachelor's degrees. Um, graduate education is supported by in multiple ways, including two training grants. So we have a chemical biology training program, which has been funded since 2010. The co-directors now are Elizabeth Boone and Jessica Seliger. And then we also have an NSF, National Science Foundation funded um, research traine traineeship award, which is directed by Professor Sarita Bhatia. Undergraduate education, as you know, also plays, plays an important part of our life. Chemistry enrolls about 11,000 students per year in chemistry courses, which is about 34,000 credit hours. We have about 300 chemistry majors, and there's been innovation across the teaching spectrum, particularly in the large uh, courses. So for example, here's Professor Joe Laha, who uh, developed the Organic Seawolf Center for Education and Research System, which is used heavily for online teaching. Now, of course, um, we all, uh, we've all lived through the COVID pandemic. Uh, Stony Brook um, emptied its labs and dorms in March 2020. We put all our courses online. Slowly, research labs have returned to normal occupancy. Um, and until the end of spring 2021, our large courses were on online. And then back in, and now in the fall of 2021, all our cl classes are back in person. There are many things that the chemistry faculty did uh, to uh, adapt to the, to the pandemic. For example, we taught our large general chemistry labs, which have about 1400 students. We, we taught them remotely using students, uh, kits that the students purchased to do experiments. One of our faculty recorded um, organic chemistry lab experiments so they could be played to the students uh, remotely. We donated PPE to, to the hospital, as did many departments on campus. And we also produced about 250 gallons of hand sanitizer for the hospital because there was a shortage. So just to give you a brief summary of the first part of my talk, I've, I've mentioned that Stonybrook moved from Oyster Bay, uh, sorry, the university moved from Oyster Bay to Stonybrook in 1962. Old chemistry was, was one of the first buildings on the new campus. And now we have a second chemistry building. Uh, we have a lot of graduate students. We teach a lot of undergraduate students each year. Now to tell you a bit more about research, which, have, which is one of the themes of today's talk. Uh, in 2020, our department had $10.5 million in research expenditures. And this was spread across the disciplines um, in which chemistry functions. So from fundamental understanding of matter with very high resolution, uh, to developing new materials for energy storage and water filtration and new diagnostics and, th and therapeutics for human diseases. And so one of the themes today is that chemistry research is very interdisciplinary. So if you think about the traditional areas of chemistry, organic chemistry, physical chemistry, inorganic chemistry, analytical chemistry, nowadays research is done um, a lot of research is done at the interface between these traditional disciplines. And this is certainly true at Stony Brook. So for example, we have faculty who do research in materials chemistry. They're developing new materials for energy and information storage, new materials which are adhesives or coatings or self-regenerating materials, um, materials for, for filtering water and for filtering air, so masks for filtering out viruses and also nanomaterials. We have faculty who do research at the interface between chemistry and biology. They're developing new chemical tools to dissect complex biological systems, such as neurotransmission, and also taking the first steps in developing new drugs to treat important diseases. And we have faculty who do research in computational biology, for example, who look at the dynamics of proteins involved in infections caused by COVID virus. The other end of the spectrum, we have faculty who use um, the synchrotron colliders at the Brookhaven National Lab, which is about 35 minutes away from Stony Brook University, to, to for example, better understand the universe in the seconds after the Big Bang. We have faculty who use ultra-fast spectroscopy to, for example, watch how electrons move in molecules 
and to understand atmospheric chemistry and some of the some of the steps involved in climate change. And then we have faculty who synthesize molecular spies relate radioactive molecules that are injected into humans to detect and diagnose disease. Interdisciplinary research is supported by faculty who have joint appointments in many different departments. So this again gives you the idea of the, the breadth and scope of research in the chemistry department. So we have faculty in chemistry who have joint appointments in other departments in the College of, Engineer, uh, the College of Arts and Sciences. We have faculty who have joint appointments in departments in the College of Engineering and Applied Sciences. We have faculty who have joint appointments in the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. And we have faculty who have joint appointments in the School of in departments in the School of Medicine. We have faculty who have joint appointments at neighboring Brookhaven National Lab, which I've just mentioned and also at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, which is about halfway between Stony Brook and New York City. Layered on top of this, our um, faculty are directors and members of institutes and centers that support interdisciplinary science, and faculty have also founded startup companies. And again, the, the message I'm con conveying here is that barriers are low to collaboration between departments, colleges, schools, and neighboring institutions. And this is one of the key strengths of Stony Brook University. So I've mentioned that research in the department is highly inter interdisciplinary and that faculty have joint appointments in many other departments, schools, and institutions. I've talked a bit about institutes and centers, of which faculty are members, and also some entrepreneurship where faculty have started um, their own companies. Now, this, as Professor Sampson mentioned at the beginning, the theme of this talk is about interdisciplinary research that builds on the legacy of Professor Lauterbach, who won the Nobel Prize in Physi Physiology or Medicine for discoveries leading to the invention of magnetic resonance imaging. This year is the 50th anniversary of Professor Lauterbach's conceptualization of MRI. And in honor of his discoveries, we're very pleased to welcome Professor Charlie Springer, a former Stony Brook faculty member, who will now discuss some of Professor Lauterbach's seminal contributions to science. Professor Springer. I have to unmute. <laughs> thank you, Peter, I appreciate it. And thank you, Nicole, for such a nice introduction. Uh, I really, uh, appreciate it and I'm so happy to be back in Stony Brook even though it's only virtual and I wished it was not virtual. Uh, I'm going to uh, try to share my screen here and this is always a tricky step. Uh, okay I present I hope you can see my my screen now. Is that true everybody can see it? Yes. Okay, and let me get a laser pointer. Okay, so I, I'm really pleased to tell you a bit about Paul Lauterbach's uh, discovery and conceptualization of MRI at Sony Brook, and to try to give you a sense of how profound it really was. I'm gonna just review some of the basic high school chemistry that you learned, or perhaps first year chemistry at Stony Brook. And in fact, Peter mentioned Joe Law, or here's a wonderful uh, slide uh, Joe gave me a long time ago. And uh, you'll recognize that, that these are atoms. Uh, and if we uh, ask what kind of atoms they are, of course, men, almost all of you know, those two represent hydrogen atoms and the red one represents an oxygen atom. And of course, this is the water molecule. This is the most abundant uh, molecule in your body. You roughly are 75 to 80% water. Uh, and so this is a crucial molecule. But what we care about in this, uh, in this uh, technique are, are not the clouds of electrons, because these 
colored spheres represent the clouds of electrons. We really care about the nuclei. And Joe gave me a slide of the nuclei of water. Um, and these nuclei are magnified many, many times on the scale of this figure, they would be really tiny dots. Uh, but that means that we have to remember now to use the adjective nuclear because what matters are the nuclei in this particular case. And we have to pay attention to what isotopes the nuclei are. And the most abundant isotope of oxygen is oxygen 16. The most abundant isotopes of hydrogen is one hydrogen, or, or the, which is really a, a proton because we have to pay attention to what's in the nuclei. Um, the nuclear particles in, in oxygen 16 are eight protons and eight neutrons. But in the hydrogen nuclei, it's one proton. And we even have to pay attention to what's inside the protons um, because they are quarks. Up, up and down quarks are lots of other kinds of quarks. But the reason we do is that these quarks give these protons tiny little bar magnets or magnetic moments, nuclear spins. And so now we have to start to use the adjective magnetic as well. But these are really very weak bar magnets. And so when you're walking around in the Earth's magnetic field, uh, they mostly cancel each other out and, and you're we all know you all have magnetic personalities, but you aren't very magnetic in the physical sense. But if you get into a, a modern high field magnetic resonance imager, uh, like a, with a field of three Tesla, which is 30,000 times the Earth's field, now the tendency of these bar magnets to cancel one another out is reduced and they, they form a net magnetization which you can then um, uh, uh, submit them to radio waves and they resonate, which means they pick up some of the radio wave energy and then they send it back to you. And that's called a resonance. And so you put those together and you have nuclear magnetic resonance or NMR, which is a phenomenon that was discovered right at the end of the Second World War. And now this allows us the first introduction to Paul Lauterberg. And I know this is a busy slide that's kind of hard to read, but this is uh, 1957, or the, this paper was submitted in 1956, when Paul Lauterberg was a graduate student in Pittsburgh. And he published his a paper with him as the only author in the very first issue of Journal of Chemical Physics that had communications in it. He had the first paper, and it's very rare to publish a paper by yourself as a graduate student, but what he was reporting was the first ever carbon-13 nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And I know you can't see this very well, but he picked a large number of different organic molecules all of which had, uh, many of which had more than one carbon. And he showed that the NMR resonance frequency of those different carbons in those different molecules were different and he could detect them. And this showed how useful this was going to be to chemists who wanted to study what atoms were in molecules and how they were or organized and put together. So this was the very first carbon-13 NMR spectroscopy. Paul Lauterberg was a, a graduate student. This is about the same time that Stony Brook was founded in Oyster Bay, as Peter mentioned, uh, and only about 10 years after NMR was discovered. So he became pretty well known in the chemistry community and the chemistry NMR community. And Stony Brook, as soon as he got his PhD from the University of Pittsburgh, um, Stony Brook recruited him. He didn't even do a postdoc and he came as an associate professor. And, uh, but I wanna make one more point before I show you the first picture of him. It was really important that he stated this was carbon-13 because the most abundant isotope of carbon is carbon-12. 
but it has no bar magnet, it has no magnetic moment. So you could not do spectroscopy with it. Carbon-13 is only 1% abundant, uh, but it does have a magnetic moment or a bar magnet. However, it's really important to recognize that even though we use the mass number carbon-13, that does not mean it has any radioactivity. Carbon-13 is a stable isotope. It has no radioactivity. This scientist has a Geiger counter and he's trying to count uh, uh, radiation from carbon-13 and there is none. There is a tiny naturally abundant carbon-14 used for radiocarbon dating that is radioactive, but Paul was studying the carbon spectroscopy uh, using the 1% of natural abundance that was carbon-13. So we have to use the mass number, but it does not mean it's radioactive. And that's, and I'll show you how political correctness got involved in this in a, in a few minutes. So Stony Brook recruited Paul as one of the earliest faculty members. And here's a wonderful picture of some of the earliest members of uh, the chemistry faculty, Harold Friedman, Francis Bonner, who was the chair, as Peter mentioned, Albert Haim, Max Wolfsburg, and Ed Kossauer. And the earliest picture I have of Paul Lauterberg. And you'll notice that Paul is holding a hammer and nobody knows why he's holding a hammer. Is he threatening his colleague? Is he threatening to destroy Francis Bonner's vacuum line in the back? Nobody knows. And he did not normally walk around with a hammer. So I don't know why he has one, but it's a great picture. So this is, uh, he came in uh, 1965 and I came in 1968. So this is sometime in between there. Um, this is in the old chemistry building, because um, by the time Paul arrived, the old chemistry building was open and the university had moved from Oyster Bay. Uh, so this is near the beginning of, of NMR spectroscopy. So Paul uh, was uh, progressing along in, in the chemistry department. And in the summer of 1971, he did not have a grant that paid his summer salary. And so he was spending the summer at a company in New Kensington, Pennsylvania, up the Gall Allegheny River from Pittsburgh, uh, which is a company he had some interest in and he was trying to save it financially. And while he was there, it was an NMR company, uh, he had the idea, and it was 50 years ago, last September the 2nd, this is his notebook, of if you had Spatial, you could spatially resolve nuclear magnetic uh, signals if you had what you could get the distribution of magnetic nuclei if you imposed a magnetic field and not just a magnetic field but a magnetic field gradient. And so, uh, this was the concept of the idea in 1971 that you should be able to make pictures. Uh, from this method. But then he had to, of course, try to do an experiment, a proof of concept or to put it into practice. And so he came back to Stony Brook in the fall and Paul had some research NMR instruments. This is a picture of one of them um, in, a, in a basement laboratory in old chemistry. Um, but he didn't have a lot of grant money and it was kind of hard to maintain these old instruments. And he needed to be able to add, impose a prescribed magnetic field gradient, as he said, a non-uniform magnetic field. And the way you did this in these old magnets was pretty arduous and wasn't very easy. And so he didn't use his own experiments in the basement of chemistry because Stony Brook had recently purchased a brand new kind of instrument supplied by the Varian Company, which is a reliable routine uh, NMR spectrometer that chemists would use to determine molecular structures and do chemical synthesis uh, uh, verifications. Uh, and this was on the uh, third floor of the old chemistry building. And it was a very routine and reliable instrument. 
and it had a magnet. The magnet is a small magnet, electromagnet. It's, it's 14,000 times the Earth's magnetic field, but it's here. But it had a very convenient way of uh, working on the uniformity of the magnetic field. And so he decided he would test out his idea with this instrument. The problem was that this was a routine departmental instrument used by a lot of the other chemists for determining structures of their synthetic products. And it was very useful. This is a picture. This is a schematic diagram of the magnet. This is like the North Pole and the South Pole. But it had a very simple arrangement for just adjusting current through an electrical circuit to make the magnetic field uniform, which would mean that all the invisible magnetic field lines would be very parallel to each other. And that's the way the chemists wanted. They wanted all these lines to be very, very parallel to each other so they could do high resolution spectroscopy. Paul wanted to use this to impose a magnetic field gradient. He wanted the field to be stronger, that is the lines closer together in one place and weaker in another place. And he, so he wanted to take the current and turn it all the way off to the side to a high or low value. And they didn't like this. So they said, okay, you can use this magnet, but you have to do this work at night when we're not using it. So he did all of this work, early work at night. He could easily make a non-uniform magnetic field gradient the way he wanted it. So he's realized, well, to prove this idea, I also have to have a sample that's not uniform. That is, the magnetic nuclei are not the same. Every so he took a five millimeter test tube and he could have just filled the test tube with water, but that wouldn't, all he would do is get a picture of a test tube. Uh, and that's not so, so interesting. So what he did is, he put two small capillary tubes filled with water in this test tube so that now he had a non-uniform sample. There was water here and water here, but not water uh, in between. And this is a very tiny tube and he put it in the center of this magnet. And you can see, depending on how you put it in here and turn it around its own axis, there will be orientations where one of the tubes is in a very strong magnetic field, and one of the tubes is in a lesser magnetic field. And he reasoned that their nuclear magnetic resonances frequencies would be different uh, depending on the orientation. And this led to this famous paper in Nature, the, the very first uh, uh, report of, of uh, MR imaging. He submitted this paper about a year later, after he had the idea in October of 72, it was rejected at first, of course, and then it was published in March of 1973. And he showed that if you just rotated the tube around in the, in the field gradient, and in other words, or you could picture it as moving the field gradient in different directions, the NMR spectrum, in the direction of a gradient is or the NMR spectrum in the presence of a gradient is just a projection of the image because this tube was experiencing a higher field and this tube was experiencing lower field. So if he just back projected after several different orientations, he got the image of the water in the two capillary tubes. And this is the first ever magnetic resonance image. And uh, th that will be 50 years ago in 1973, two, uh, two years from now. There's one other point that I should make that you should understand how profound this was. And that is if I look back at this picture of, a, uh, of the magnet and the tube, it was understood in the 70s that if you were going to use radiation and radio waves are radiation, they're just not ionizing radiation. Uh, the wavelength had to be smaller than the object you wanted to make a picture of. If you're gonna make a picture with radiation, the wavelength has to be smaller than the object. 
well if you do a simple calculation the radio waves which are surrounding you every day this is 60 megahertz not not too far from some of your favorite radio stations those wavelengths are humongous they're like this radio wave was uh, had a wavelength of five meters a thousand times longer than the size of the tube and there were many people who said you cannot make images uh, this way because uh, the wavelength of the radiation you're using, which is not ionizing radiation, just radio waves, uh, is much too long. And in fact, even one of Paul's own postdocs who was making images every day came to him and said, we can't make images this way. But Paul realized that he was doing something different than the normal way of making images. And he was also a classical scholar. And so he decided to name this technique zygmatography, a very a terrible word with a, a mouthful. But he took the Greek word zygma, which means bringing together. He was bringing together a magnetic field and radio waves to make pictures, photography. And that's what he meant by this term, zygmatography. And so it was very quickly after he did this experiment with the two little tubes that he made the first image of a living organism. This is from 1975 in the chemistry graduate brochure. Uh, he, he calls it a zygmatogram of the thoracic cavity of a live mouse. And so it's a cross section of the mouse at the air at the level where the lungs are. So these are the lungs. And this is the water in the rest of the body of the mouse. Um, he had an earlier image from like 1972, where his daughter Sharon Lauderbur went out to, to uh, Oldfield Beach in, in Stony Brook in, uh, in Smithtown Bay and found a tiny little five millimeter clam that would fit inside that tube. And at a faculty meeting, he showed a picture of a clam, an image of a clam. It was just a smear, it looked like a clam, but it kind of had a white spot in the air in the center, which was an artifact. But one of the chemistry faculty raised his hand and said, Paul, is that the soul of the clam that you're imaging? And of course, everybody laughed. Nobody knew whether it was the soul of the clam. It probably wasn't. But here is a, here's the first image I have that he obtained of a living uh, animal, a mouse. And I want to point out that the photograph, the, the image was produced by Joseph Frank, who was an undergraduate student in chemistry that worked in Paul's research lab. And I'll mention him again later because uh, the students are very important in, in these. So now let's just flash forward 50 years just to show you where this has led. This is an image from our laboratory, and I'm going to highlight in red any of the authors who are former uh, sea wolves or, or patriots as we were known in those days. This is from Bill Rooney, who was a chemistry graduate student, undergraduate and graduate student. And you can see now that at 50, water proton MRI is most widely known for its anatomic virtuosity. Uh, you can see exquisite images in any, uh, any plane. This is a an axial plane, a coronal plane, a sagittal plane of the human brain. It, it, these look like they're photographs of slices from a cadaver, but they really are images of a living person. And so what he was finding with those little tubes of water, those capillaries of water, has, has just blossomed into something amazing. Um, 30 years ago, the method, the technique of functional MRI uh, uh, was, was developed by other laboratories, um, which meant you could see brain function. This is a study we did at Brookhaven uh, a few years later, uh, but you, we were asked the subject to tap his, or his fingers, his right hand, and you could see changes in the NMR signal in the motor cortex of the brain. And so now functional MRI, I'm sure you've all heard about it in the, in the newspapers, in the news, uh, has kind of 
has a tremendous effect on experimental psychology and neuroscience because you can see activity in the brain. There's a researcher at Yale who just puts people in the magnet lying there resting uh, awake and sees fluctuations and he claims he can distinguish, he could distinguish the brain fluctuations from Peter Tong from Charlie Springer by just looking at us lying in the magnet. Uh, so there's a tremendous interest in, um, in functional uh, MRI. Uh, here is a, a picture using the diffusion of water in the, in the, in the body, in the brain, to determine the, the fiber tracts, the white matter fiber tracts, nerve tracts connecting one part of the cortex to a brain to another. And so you can see all of this in, in beautiful detail. We've even st starting to try to get into the game and not just doing anatomic imaging, but measuring uh, awake west resting activity of one of the most vital enzymes in biology. My sister gave me a t-shirt a few years ago that says on a cellular level, I'm really quite busy. And what I'm trying to do, I guess, is trying to show that maybe that's really true because you see at a metabolic activity is high in the parts of the brains where it should be high and low in the parts of the brains where it should not be high. Uh, it's still pretty crude, but it's early. So uh, already quite a few years ago, there was a poll of a uh, general uh, internist, uh, 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 family me uh, medicine, family doctors, about their views of the importance, relative importance of 30 medical innovations and in fact, MRI and CT, contrast tomography, came out well above all the other really important innovations that have occurred. And, and of course, you can also get very high resolution images with computed tomography, but there is a pretty large real radiation dose there of, of x-rays. So in, in the years ensuing, I, I imagine these influence have become even more important. So let me just tell you the, the history of the name. People didn't really like the word zygmatography. And so they thought, well, the best, the most descriptive name for it is nuclear magnetic resonance imaging, NMRI. But uh, the marketing or, or advertising uh, influence became important and radiology departments realized they wanted to stress that it did, or, or wanted to stress that it did not use ionizing radiation. And just the word nuclear connotes to a lot of people in the general public uh, ionizing radiation. And so they struck the word nuclear and it became magnetic resonance imaging. It really is nuclear magnetic resonance imaging because we're using the nuclei, but we're not using any uh, uh, ionizing radiation. This uh, marketing uh, trend has continued. Finally, the departments of radiology, the name radiology as a discipline is over a hundred years old from the first x-ray images, but they decided they don't want to emphasize the use of ionizing radiation. And a lot of departments are changing their name to like diagnostic. Uh, imaging. So let me just finish with some pictures of Paul and the students who did a lot of the work. This is David Kramer, who uh, got his PhD and went on to work, uh, have a career at Diasonics in California. Uh, here is Peter Bindel, who after his PhD had a distinguished career in Israel. Ching Yin Chin, after her PhD degree, had a distinguished research career at the NIH. Um, and some pictures of Paul in the press. And so by 1975, Newsday uh, was starting to notice um, uh, Paul. And here, here is a picture of the first magnet he had built by a company and delivered to actually do zoomatography or MR imaging. And it, it had been just developed. And uh, this is 1975. Here's a picture a couple of years later 
uh, with him, and you notice that they have added the gradient coils outside the magnet because you need the gradient, the magnetic field gradients to make images on the inside. And they decided not to waste space inside the bore, but put the gradients on the outside. This magnet, I don't have a color picture of it, it's colored red, so it's very, very dramatic uh, looking. And here's a, a wonderful picture of Paul giving a lecture in 1984, showing the bar magnets of the nuclei, which give you this resonance as the eyes of a smiling face. So that's kind of maybe part of NMR theory or not. Um, and then uh, in, the, in the early 80s, 1984, Paul was becoming so well known um, around the world for this technique of magnetic resonance imaging as it was then known, that uh, the New York Times began, became aware of efforts to recruit Paul to other institutions. This happens with successful researchers uh, people uh, want to bring them to their institution and they start to offer uh, more, more money and more support for research uh, equipment. And there were many efforts going on and the New York Times noticed this in 1984. Um, and uh, the Village Times noticed it in 1984 uh, that Paul was effort. Efforts were being made to keep NMR to recruit the NMR pioneer and Stony Brook was working to keep him. And then finally Newsday uh, broke the story, Other, others did too, that in fact, although Stony Brook made really valiant efforts, if you read this article, to keep him, the University of Illinois won. And in 1985, Paul moved from Stony Brook to Illinois, taking with him some of these, these magnets. And so he then spent uh, about almost 20 years at Illinois, almost the same length of time that he was in Stony Brook from 65 to 85. He came back, of course, to visit a number of times. And here's a case where he's giving a lecture at, at a symposium that honored the research of undergraduates. And he, and particularly Dr. Joseph Frank, who stayed at Stony Brook and got his MD, he was an undergraduate chemistry major, got his MD. Dr. Ruth Heilberger, who was an undergraduate student in Paul's lab, got her MD and PhD at Stony Brook and is now a chaired professor at the University of Texas in Houston. Uh, Paul always commented that he really enjoyed having undergraduates work in his lab because they were much more adventurous and willing to try interesting new ideas than graduate students uh, and then postdocs and other faculty. As people get older, they tend to get more conservative. And Paul really enjoyed having new ideas and trying them out and that his undergraduate students really like this kind of thing too. Here's the last picture I have of us together at Stony Brook in 1990 with Lisa Feig, a chemistry department uh, administrative assistant. I suppose it was a, a, a um, commencement because we didn't go around wearing academic gowns most of the time. But anyway, it's kind of the last picture I have of, of us together at Stony Brook. I moved out to Brookhaven Lab mostly in 1993. And then of course, I moved here in 2003 and that same year, Paul won the Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology. He shared it with Peter Mansfield of Nottingham in England. Here's a picture of Paul receiving the Nobel Prize from the uh, King of Sweden. Um, and then um, a few years later, we created a, uh, an exhibit. Uh, I was involved in designing the first exhibit, which was on the first floor. This is the current exhibit on the second floor of the new chemistry building. And if you haven't seen it, I, I really encourage you to go see it because it's a, it's a nice exhibit. It has the old A60 that was used for those experiments. It has two tubes with capillary tube. It has a picture of the, uh, it has the, the actual uh, 
uh, bound uh, issue of Nature with the article, uh, pictures of his Nobel Prize. It has a video running that helps explain it. And I really gives me a lot of pleasure to think of people, students, and anybody who's there learning about how NMR worked, how MRI worked, and how it was developed uh, at Stony Brook. And that same year, 2011, the American Chemical Society honored Stony Brook by naming it a National Historical Chemical Landmark. And here is the president of the ACS awarding the award. And you may recognize the late John Mar Marburger, former president of uh, Stony Brook, um, uh, receiving this landmark. And I'd like to just close, because this is my favorite picture of Paul, and it's a good way to remember him. Ex ex uh, explaining some important point about uh, bar magnets with a pencil and, and being very happy and enjoying doing it. So I really thank you very much for this chance to reminisce and I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Charlie. That was a extremely interesting, fascinating um, discussion of the history, Paul's history at Stony Brook University. Um, I just wanted to end by sharing a few additional notes about the department. And so today what we're doing is announcing a major fundraising initiative um, based on Paul Outerber's legacy um, to raise funds for the department to support faculty and student, students who are seeking to do high risk, high payoff research. And through, through, for example, student fellowships and travel awards, instrumentation for research and teaching, professional development activities. And our goal is to raise $4 million for this fund. What I wanted to do just to end was to share just a few examples of cutting edge research being conducted in the department at the present time, just to give you a, a taste for what's going on. So I mentioned earlier in the presentation about physical chemists watching electrons move in molecules. So Tom Allison is associate professor in the department. He won the 2017 Stony Brook $200,000 discovery prize. And he uses ultra-fast spectroscopy to plumb the depths of um, matter and how matter works. As it says here, to develop tools to see further, smaller, deeper, and faster. Then we have um, Esther Boris. She's an assistant professor in the department. Uh, she's won a number of awards and was also this year's uh, Stony Brook Discovery Prize winner. And um, Professor Boros is building on the legacy of Paul Outerber using imaging techniques to um, diagnose and treat disease. So she uses um, radioactive molecules as non-invasive diagnostics for detecting disease. And these molecules also um, carry payloads to destroy, for example, cancer cells. Uh, then we have Karina Chapman. She's the Lauha Fowler Endowed Chair in Materials Chemistry. She's the co-director of the Genesis uh, Energy Frontier Research, Research Center. And she does research in the area of nano, nanomaterials and developing new materials for energy storage. Um, ben Shaw is a distinguished professor in the department. He won the 2020 Prince Sultan bin Abdullah International Prize for Water. And Professor Shao makes materials to purify water. In particular, he uses um, cellulose uh, obtained by chemical treatment of biomass um, as a way of removing toxins from, from water. So developing sustainable systems for water purification. Um, Wao Jima is a distinguished professor in the department. One of his, and he's won the um, Ernest Gunter Award in Chemistry of Natural Products from the American Chemical Society in 2019, amongst his many awards. He's the director of the Institute for Chemical Biology and Drug Discovery at Stony Brook University and also founder of Targogenics. 
Um, he has many projects, one of which is to, to develop new therapies for pain, for pain um, and, and cancer treatment. Uh, Ming Yu Nai is an associate professor in the department. He won the 2019 Young Ac Academic Investigator Award. And he has several projects, one of which is to um, edit carbohydrates in much more efficient ways than can currently be performed uh, using sunlight to drive uh, reactions. So a, a greener way to make chemicals. Um, and then finally, I wanted to mention my own research program. Uh, I'm interested in using kinetics to improve the development of, of drugs, to, to develop drugs more efficiently and to better, better predict their activity in humans. I should show my little movie, which is a reaction coordinate of a drug binding to its target. So there we are, thank you. I wanted to say thank you to everybody. I wanted to say thank you to the many alumni, faculty and friends that generously support the Department of Chemistry. We are honestly, we're so grateful for your support. And, um, you know, your don donations support many aspects of department life across research and teaching. And so once again, to introduce the Department Lauterbach Fund, uh, this is our major fundraising initiative. I've mentioned uh, briefly about some of the highlights of research in the department. And um, if you want to learn more about this initiative, you can contact myself or Hoden Hassan in the College of Arts and Sciences. And finally, I wanted to say that we have um, an in-person alumni reception at the Spring American Chemical Society National Meeting in San Diego. So San Diego isn't, isn't a bad place to go for a, for a scientific meeting. And we're currently finalizing exactly which day that will be, but the, the national meeting is between March 20th and 24th. So thank you very much for joining both myself and Professor Springer, and I'm sure we'd both be delighted to answer any questions that you might have. Yeah, hi, this is Peter. This is uh, Mitch Koppelman. Uh, this has uh, been a, a real nice retrospective. Uh, I had the pleasure of being at Stony Brook in 68, the year that uh, Charlie Springer joined and also with overlapping with Paul. Uh, Paul was my freshman chemistry professor, and it's kind of hard to say too many people think that uh, they had a Nobel laureate as a freshman chemistry professor. Uh, he truly did have a, uh, an interest in undergraduates, though his lecture style was not the most exciting. Uh, you certainly knew he was interested. <laughs> and to uh, to my friend Charlie Springer, who probably doesn't remember me, he joined in six. Yes, I do. I, well, I was one of your, if not the first, uh, undergraduate that you advised. So uh, you did a good job. I went on and got a PhD, and uh, it's nice to see you all again. So, uh, Peter, thank you for putting this together. It was quite interesting. You're you're most welcome. You are. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. Uh, uh, Charles, uh, Steve Heller, I was there in, in 1963 with the first two NMR machines <clears throat> that were put installed in the basement, the HR100 and the A60. What happened to those and why was there a different machine on, on the third floor now that was used? <laughs> That's a great question. I don't know what eventually happened to them, but uh, remember those old uh, research NMR instruments in those days had had tube electronics, that is, a, electron, uh, a vacuum tube for electronics. And, and the, the electronic circuits in the radio frequency part were pretty complicated. And uh, those tubes were very sensitive. And so those two instruments had a lot of time where they were down. And Paul did not have a lot of money to maintain them. And, but the Varian A60 was a reliable machine that was on the third floor. And uh, as long as he used it at night and returned the, the gradient back to zero before he left in the morning, the organic chemist let him use it. I don't know what happened to those instruments in the basement. It's that lab, last time I was there, which was 20 years ago, is not even, well, it'd be 
it became George Kwai's lab, I think. Anyway, um, I don't know what happened to them. But the reason was they weren't working for most of the time. I was a new assistant professor, and I went down and kind of made them work. But he, he, he used the A60 at night. Hi, Joe. I see you. Hi, Charlie. How are you? Okay, uh, nice you? talk. I mean, you know, obviously, I was at Stony Brook in the radiology department. Uh, I started in 72. And so and I went through with a master's with Paul through 77 and then went on to medical school at Stony Brook. Yeah. Uh, to some of the things you didn't point out about the Walker magnet, the red magnet with the outside with the gradient yes. uh, telephone cables that we had to pull actually from a wheel to be able to get them around the magnet. <laughs> magnet there was we had some um uh bookcases metal bookcases because we didn't have enough steel to counteract the, the z gradient basically at that point the actually i would have been the y gradient uh because of a rebarb in the floor of the uh basement and that was one of the things that we have to do because we couldn't shim it out uh, you know, I went on actually my years at Stony Brook obviously have done me well because now I've been at the NIH for almost 38 years as a senior investigator and still doing MR and doing a bunch of other things. But yeah, but yeah, we certainly did an awful lot, including one of the things you left out is that in the original nature paper, Paul doped one of the capillary tubes manganese. And therefore, he was yes. one of the first. Yes. Stony Brook was one of the first groups to actually start with MR contrast agents. Absolutely, uh, I have, and manganese. I have a another slide of that, and I use it in another lecture recently. But I didn't have time for it today. No, that started the whole world of contrast contrast agents. No. Yeah. No, no. It's good. Good, good to see you, Joe. You look good great. You, Charlie. You, see you too. Candace, 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 I have a Candace. question for you. Can you hear me or am I mute? No, Hello? I can hear you. You can. Great. I was wondering if functional MRI is a fancy way of saying kinetics. Ah, that's a great question, Albert. <laughs> and Albert, Albert taught me so much about kinetics that I, I, I think of you every other day. Oh, um, <laughs> it, it is. Uh, functional MRI is, is poorly named. It means brain function. It doesn't mean the NMR is working. Um, uh, and it means a study of brain function. And it does involve kinetics in a complicated way. Um, it turns out that when you increase uh, uh, neuronal activity in a certain part of your brain, uh, you take more oxygen off of the hemoglobin in the blood cells. And as Albert Hain knows better than anybody else, when you have fully oxygenated hemoglobin, it's diamagnetic. It has no unpaired electrons. If you start taking oxygen off of the iron and hemoglobin, it becomes paramagnetic. It has unpaired electrons. And they have much larger bar magnets than the, than the nuclear magnets. And so as you start to uh, use some brain function more, you start deoxygenating some blood more, and that makes that blood paramagnetic and it affects the magnetism of the water around the blood vessels. But you also increase the flow of blood because, that, because when you're doing this activity, you're also using glucose and oxygen from the blood and the brain wants more fresh blood, fresh hemoglobin, and the increase the blood, blood flow increases. And that brings more diamagnetic, fully oxygenated blood. So in fact, when you do thinking, the, the actual blood becomes less paramagnetic because the, the new blood, blood flow overcomes the uh, removal of oxygen from the hemoglobin. And so it has to do with magnetic susceptibility because the blood becomes, normal blood is slightly paramagnetic when you, or fresh blood is diamagnetic. And in fact, Paul helped me introduce 
the concepts of magnetic susceptibility into MR, in vivo MR, and it's a change in the magnetic susceptibility. So it has to do with the kinetics of, of deoxygenation and the kinetics of blood flow. So it has to do with kinetics. Everything has to do with kinetics, yeah. but it's very complicated kinetics. I understand. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for the question. Hi, Charlie. It was good to hi. see you. Ken, how are you? Good to Richard, see you. Richard's here too. He wanted to hey, say hi. Hi. hi, how are you? Good to see good, you. Very good, thank you. You used to teach yeah. us how to sing. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Okay, the okay corral. Yeah. I remember Marcelino Bernardo, a yes. colleague of mine who, yeah. who was in graduate school. We were at the same time, and he would bring dogs from the pound down late at night yes. to the basement to do yeah. non invasive studies, you know, yeah. <laughs> when uh, Paul Lauderbur was, was still there. Uh, yes, Marcelino is at the NIH and he's still doing yeah. research, but there's a a really terrible story about those dogs. Uh -oh. uh, sometime after Paul left um, uh, in 1985, we were going to install the uh, Varian XL, uh, our Varian, um, I can't remember the name, the 400 uh, uh, megahertz instrument in that lab. And so we had to clean out one of his labs. And somehow I wasn't there that day when the lab was being cleaned out, they found the body of a dog wrapped in plastic several times. In the old days, you know, people oh. weren't so careful about uh, disposing of bio waste or radioactive hazards or other things. Uh, it happened with all, all chemistry labs back in the 80s or so. You had to clean out your, your storage of chemicals. At Brookhaven, we had to find every last trace of radioisotopes in different labs and you couldn't store bio waste like that so but yeah but i remember those those days yes marcelino is doing very well yes it's great great to see you too also good to see you as well this is, this is like old home week would anybody else like to share a recollection or ask a question? Am I unmuted? Oh, yes. Arnold Wishnia. I just wanted to say hello, Charlie. It's been hello, long. Arnold. How are you? I'm okay. No. Arnold is the person who said, do hyperpolarized xenon MRI. And Mitchell Albert did it. Yeah. <laughs> also, uh, uh, Arnold, when he was a postdoc at Yale, did the very first NMR spectrum of, of a protein, uh, which is the world of NMR of proteins, of course, as Peter alluded to, has become a very important point of part of um, structure of proteins and, and uh, enzymes now. But, uh, but Arnold did the very first NMR spectrum, very low field spectrum of a protein. What? Hi, Charles. I see you've unmuted yourself. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I just uh, like to thank both uh, you and uh, Dr. Springer for putting this together. Uh, I really uh, enjoyed uh, seeing it. Yeah, you're Charles. most welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Good to see you, Charles. Yes. Ooh. Very good to see you too, Charlie. <laughs> Goodness, I haven't seen so many of you in such a long time. Maybe, maybe by uh, 1973, which will be the 50th anniversary, we can do something in person, Peter. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we really wanted to do something in person this year, but it just 
it just wasn't wasn't really possible. No, it's not. Um, but yes, let's plan for two years' time to celebrate that nature paper. Yeah. yeah Hi, <laughs> Long time no see. That uh, you, you are Ojima. Hi, you are. How are you? <laughs> Good to see you. Good to see you too. Anybody else that like to say hi? I see all these chats. I'm not very good at handling these chats, but I see a whole bunch of them. So. I think I think Swati's going to say something. I know it's great to see all of you again, especially Professor Springer and Professor Tange. I don't know many uh, many of you others. And I think uh, Professor Haim was on the chat. And yes. So nice to see all of you and to hear all about Stony Brook and to remember everything about Paul Lotover because those days we remembered visits to his basement lab and see all the animals. And it was very interesting. Uh, those were the days he was developing. Uh, I mean, the zoomatography those days it was called. So yeah. nice to hear the talk and the history, uh, Professor Springer. And Thank you hear about Stony Brook and how, how well it's progressing. Feel proud to be a PhD yes. from Stony Brook. Yeah, I could not tell you all the story. As some of you noticed, I suppose, that the Stony Brook football team came out here in September to play at the University of Oregon, which is kind of a powerhouse in college football. Uh, but the people in Oregon uh, kind of didn't know where this place was. <laughs> Some of the announcers said, well, I think it's a research university in New York. And, uh, and so they were, it's, a, it's unfortunate in, in the general public, universities get known by their football teams and not by the research that they do. So <laughs> anyway, anyway, so now Stony Brook, the name is getting out uh, among the general public because of the football team. Of course, they didn't do very well against the University of Oregon, but that's the way it goes. <laughs> but we all, all of us here, there's a whole bunch of us ex, ex Sea Wolves or ex Patriots, as we used to be called. We all watch the game. So. Well, these are wonderful recollections. Um, I think we're going to stop quite soon. Would anybody else like to make a comment? I'd love to just jump in here. Um, I, I think he's off the meeting right now, but I, I did want to thank Lawrence Ginsburg for starting the chat. Um, that was fun to read and have um, everyone share a little bit about some of their experiences. And Professor Springer, I think there were two more messages in the chat. Um, one from Mike Johnson, uh, looks like a December 80 um, BS engineering chemistry degree. Uh, he thinks that you, um, what his lecture in uh, 102 in the spring of 78. So I thought that was a fun message there in the chat. Um, and I see Lloyd Altman is still with us, uh, BA in chemistry, 1973. Uh, looks like um, he took classes with you in uh, inorganic, inorganic chemistry. Um, yes. Thank you for that, sharing that. If you have thank fond you. memories. Thank you all. <laughs> so what about him? Is here that thought about maybe you should say something. Who? What about <laughs> him? Albert, he already did say one thing. But oh, I think I, I love to hear a question. <laughs> okay, <sorry. laughs> this is my collections. Uh, my goodness. Uh, yep. Uh, like Charlie, when I when I do my research, I also think about kinetics, and I think about Albert Hain. <laughs> yeah. I I often use a quote from Dick Porter, former Professor Porter who said that kinetics is the queen of chemistry. And so you would then ask him, you'd say, so Dick, who's the king of chemistry? And you'd think he would say thermodynamics, but he said, there is no king. 
and and the and it's true. <laughs> And all I can say is uh, I do not recognize the department as it is today compared to what it was, uh, let's say, 20 years ago, which yeah. for me is just a second or so in, in my lifetime. There's <laughs> <laughs> just two comments. Hello, everyone. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a long it, time it, since it, I've been in Stony Brook. Last time I was there was for Vladimir's second tribute after he passed away. Yes. Um, the picture that you showed of him holding the hammer, I yes. believe, was in the Specula yearbook 1968. Ah, that's interesting because I've never known quite the origin of that there was, picture. It was the chemistry department photograph for the yearbook. Yes. Uh, and why, well, why he was holding the hammer, I have no idea. No, I don't either. You know, I don't know, Peter, if the students still do this, but every year, at the Christmas departmental Christmas party, the students would put on, the graduate students would put on a skit roasting various faculty members and some of them got pretty, pretty roasted. Uh, and I suspected, and they would produce slideshows to, uh, and they would make up a, a plot to go with these slides. And I suspect that was one of those uh, slides from one of those shows and somehow Lauderbur was, creeping around with a hammer, destroying everybody else's equipment or something. I, I don't know what it was. If, if anybody knows, I'd really like to know where that picture, how it came to be. I remember oh, Christmas yeah. party where Professor Lotterbaugh was given a headrest because he would be dozing off in many seminars yeah. and people thought he wasn't listening. But at the end of it, he would ask some question <laughs> uh, and people were shocked. <laughs> it was always a very perceptive question too. Yes, yes. <laughs> But one other comment um, down here in Nashville, uh -huh. at Vanderbilt, they have some studies going on that to refer to functional NMR. Yes. Is, uh, there, any in, in, is there any difference between functional NMR and functional MRI? Well, I've never heard the term functional NMR, so I, don't, I know the group at, at Vanderbilt yeah. very well. I don't know what they, if that's the group, I don't know what they mean by that. Uh -huh. um, it's in some look, some research blurbs. Yeah. Well, functional MRI means the study of brain function. Right. Um, yeah. Non-invasively. And it's pretty amazing uh, what you can do. Albert Hayne mentioned he couldn't recognize the department now, but of course, our department has an extremely strong foundation laid by people like yourself and, of course, Professor Springer. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. You. Yeah. Well, I showed a picture of Albert. Yeah, he was there with all the other guys. My goodness. So you were in the, yeah, why did he have a hammer? You were in the picture. <laughs> Albert never needed a hammer to make his points. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know why my picture isn't showing. I, in, in another of the pages that I have, I'm, I can see myself, uh, but here- Because your video is stopped. I guess it must be, yeah. Mm -hmm. If you click on your in, in video- In a way, it doesn't, it doesn't bother me too much. I don't know if anyone wants to see an 80 <laughs> year old guy. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. This is yeah. fantastic. It will be so nice to get together in person with you all. Yes. Oh, yeah. and, it be nice. Two years from yeah. now, yeah, maybe. I it hope would so. Be great. It would be great, yeah. All right, I think in closing out today, I again, on behalf of the Stony Brook Alumni Association, I just want to thank you all for being here. Our alumni, our friends, our faculty, our alumni faculty, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I really want to thank uh, Dean Sampson, Professor Peter Tong, Professor Charles Springer, 
and the College of Arts and Sciences for providing this wonderful, engaging session. Thank you so much. It was so nice to see so many of you contribute today. Um, and it was nice to hear your stories and your memories. Thank you very much. We hope to see you soon in person. Thank you, Janet. Thank you everybody for joining us.